Now, we just got through Christmas, we just got through the New Year's, and the last, second to last message of hope, I wrote that 91% of New Year's resolutions fail. 91% fail. That means you have a 9% chance of not failing. So instead of focusing on a change at the beginning or the end of a year, I challenge us today to change once and for all. No matter the time, no matter the day, no matter the year, I say we make the decision to change today, to change our community right now. So as, uh, as Rusty likes to say, he likes to set the stage. <clears throat> now I'm not going to go into a lot of uh, detail about the, uh, the, the book of Thessalonians, but I do want to uh, tell you where this charge comes from. So if we look at 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says we are to be ambassadors for Christ. Ambassadors for Christ, not, not representing me. An ambassador is somebody who has the authority to speak and act on behalf of somebody else. So that means if you are a professing Christian, you have the call, you have the charge to be an ambassador of Christ. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, if anybody's taught Awana over the last several decades, it says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as workmen. <clears throat> so, present yourself approved to God as workmen. A workman is somebody that's employed to do something. Approved means that you're, uh, it, you're satisfactory at that task. So, therefore, if we are an approved workman for God, that means we have the charge to be ambassadors, as this one says, but then we also have been, we have that stamp of approval that says we are able to go out and share the gospel. That's it. So this is where we're going to pick up today with God sending out this urgent uh, request. Uh, when Dr. Carter asked me to uh, preach today, uh, the Lord's been laying this text on my heart for probably well over a month, month and a half, and I didn't understand why. And then when uh, Dr. Carter asked me, I understood very clearly. So the, the, the task is that we're going to be encouraging the faithful Christians walk so we can uh, be an approved workman of the gospel of Jesus Christ alone. So if you want to stand for today's reading found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 through 23. It's a short passage. However, we do have, uh, I do have an extra 10 minutes because we started 10 minutes late. So you cannot take that against my time. All right, starting in verse 14, it says, We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone, see that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench a spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete, without blame, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, being able to come to your house to worship. Father, we, we come here with, with hearts and ears that are eager to receive your message. Father, some of us, uh, whether we're in the pew or we're teachers or we're uh, proclaiming your gospel out in the community, Father, we all have the charge to follow you and to lead and to uh, know your example, so a way we can be that example to our community, to our family, to our friends who don't know who you are. So, Father, as we're examining this text today, I ask that uh, you just engulf us with the Holy Spirit, be with us as a church, so we can be in this community and surrounding to change the hearts and the lives of every child and every home, person by person, family by family. It's a, it's a huge task, but it's small to you, Lord, 
It's daunting to us, but you already know your plans. So, Father, I ask that these are the words coming from you and not myself. May you be glorified in this and not myself, Lord. So, Father, just be with us as we, as we get into Paul's uh, epistle to the Thessalonians. So, Father, we thank you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so, Mike, the kids, you do have your pew days. And remember, you do get an extra star if you guys have filled them out and show them to us. So, here we are. No iPad. Encouraging the faithful Christians walk. Now, luckily, Jesse told us what a Christian is. It is somebody who has uh, confessed with their mouth because they believe in their heart that Jesus is our Lord. So we're going to be looking at encouraging the believer's walk through corporate worship, point number one. I don't have different points right now because it's going to, I'm going to wait till the end of each little section. So encouraging the believer's walk in corporate worship. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, it says, We urge, this is Paul and uh, Timothy and company telling the church in Thessalonica that I am urging, I am encouraging you to admonish the unruly. The unruly, as, as Jesse said, is to uh, warn or reprimand those that are out of line, those that aren't living according to the word of God. Nowhere in scripture does it say ministry is fun or easy at all times. We are given commands to follow and uphold. When we are living on Jesus' behalf, we must make certain that in all we do, that we are above board. Our integrity should never be on trial. This does not mean one of us are perfect. Luke recorded Jesus' words in Luke chapter 17, verse 3. It says, Be on guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. So be on guard. Stand at attention. Pay attention. Always be on watch. This does not mean rat somebody out. It means to make sure that we don't fall ourselves into that same sin that your brother or sister is doing. It also is to tell us to help our brother and sister when you do see something wrong. But we are not responsible to judge anyone, period. Only Jesus is judge, not us. We don't have the power over life. We don't have the power over death. We don't have the power for eternity. Leave the judging up to Jesus. The only thing we're responsible to do is go to a brother or sister when sin occurs and get them to, to repent of that unrepented sin in their lives. And then it says to encourage the faint-hearted in verse 14. Encourage means to come alongside or partner with someone. In this case, the faint-hearted, uh, those that have fears or doubts. So maybe you have fear over who the next pastor is going to be or the next step in life. Maybe you have a doubt about what God really is calling you to do. Are you sure, God, that's something that you want me to do in my life? Help the weak. These are the people in the church who aren't morally or spiritually strong. Think of a new believer. Do they need help? Do they need discipleship? Kind of like a baby. It only takes a little wave to knock over a small child in the ocean. That's how a new believer is. It doesn't take much to get them off course. The enemy is always knocking. So have you sought after somebody to encourage them? And just in case Paul forgot anybody, he said, be patient with everybody. So Ephesians, Ephesians 4.29 says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, 
so that it will give grace to those who hear. Now, edification is instruction to improve someone morally. Now, we have a brother who loves to say edify, edification. I mean, he just flies that word out, and it's, it's encouraging, but sometimes we don't often know really what it means. Uh, luckily, teaching, teaching kids, I've really had to learn to, to get you know, down to the root of everything to make sure everybody understands, to instruct, to improve someone morally. So every word that flows out of our mouths must be glorifying to the Lord. Not glorifying to ourselves, but to the Lord. Finally, we see the word brethren in verse 14. Brethren. Now, I want to make sure what everybody understands. Now, everybody says the church is not the building, it's the people. I'm going to take it a step further and say it is the believers in Jesus Christ who is the church. Paul is talking to those who have already confessed that he is Lord and Savior. So, if you are lost today, when we have invitation, please come forward. Now, going to 15. See that no one repays evil, another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Now, as Christ followers, we should have no darkness or evil in us, but rather light and goodness. But how many of us have said an eye for an eye out of context? How many of us have been cut off only to get angry and mutter probably some words that is repaying evil for evil. I dare you raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. All right. I got one, one bold person here. The point is, what you're meaning is that you want to give someone what they deserve. But if we're not the judge of what they deserve, then how are we the one that's going to give that punishment out? Peter wrote how we should, be a, how we should give a blessing and not evil. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, it says, To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but give a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Now, harmonious is to think the same. Think of the choir when all of their notes, all of the chords are working together in perfect harmony. Doesn't it sound beautiful? Like, can anybody not enjoy a perfect choir? Even on perfect, we can still enjoy that too. But I mean, nonetheless, the, the point is, is that when everything is just flowing together and it sounds so awesome, like it's, it puts a, the hairs on the back of your neck, like standing straight up. So in our case, that means Christians as a whole, the believers, we should be of one mind. I also want to point out kind-hearted, generous, putting others above self. It kind of sounds a lot like humble, doesn't it? But don't return evil for evil or insult for insult, but rather be a blessing. Give a blessing. You can bless people by praying for them. But how about by just forgiving them? How about giving out compliments or encouragements? I know that's, Jesse will tell you, that's something I can definitely work on is uh, giving out encouraging uh, and words of affirmation for sure. But we can sum up verse 8 and 9 in one word. Love. Each of, us, each of us has inherited a of a blessing when we placed our faith in Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. The blessing is the forgiveness of our sins and eternity in heaven forever. Continuing on in verse 15, it says, Always seek after that which is good. So seek, it's the idea of striving to find something. Uh, all of us are familiar with hiding and hiding, hide and seek. Well, this is the idea of we're finding uh, something that which is good. And we know from Psalm uh, 107, verse 1, 
Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. So we should be seeking the Lord, for He is good. This is an active seeking, continual, day in, day out, seeking the Lord through prayer, through reading your Bible. I know, tough. Maybe not on your phone. Did you know that the Bible, you can like pretty much see the Bible like anywhere. If you go in any crowded place and you see a book, you're like, man, that's a Bible. That might be all it takes when we're out in public is to bring your actual Bible and not your tablet because anybody can see a Bible. I promise you that. Even the non-believer will know that's a Bible. That was just an extra little nugget there for you. <clears throat> so now the last part uh, verse 15 says, good for one another and for all people. So this good is love that is demonstrated by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. This does not just pertain to us loving one another, but for us loving our community, all people, in case you forgot, all people. Not these people, not those people, but all people. So when we find the love of Christ, we must share that love with others. We must build one another up and encourage each other through the love of Christ in corporate worship. By the way, if it's not good for you, it's probably not good for others. When we build relationships with one another, we will get to know each other. And our concluding point is encouraging the believer's walk. Corporate worship allows us to become unified as a body. We will know each other's strengths and weaknesses. We will be able to carry out these, these few commands that we just read in 14 and 15 by the power of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit alone. Now, encouraging the believer's walk. Now we're going to talk about our corporate and private walk with the Lord. Verse 16 says, Rejoice always. We're still in the, in the present tense, meaning a continuous activity that we continue to rejoice or delight, to show joy or delight. A close parallel is found in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always, Again, I will say rejoice. This rejoice is knowing that the Lord is always near. If you were to go back three verses in verse 1, it says that we are to stand firm in the Lord. So he is, like, like Jesse said, Miss Jesse said, that we, if, yes, we're not hand in hand with Jesus, but he is always by our side because we're standing firm in him, rejoicing that he is always near. Another way to say rejoice is exalt, which is found in, in Romans 5, uh, verses 10 and 11. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Reconciled is broken down means no longer hostile towards God. We're no longer an enemy of God. By nothing that we did, it says by his life, by Jesus' life. This enables us to be able to exalt, as verse 11 says, or rejoice because of the extreme joy found in the reconciliation or restoration with God. Moving on, in verse 17, it says, pray without ceasing. Now, we're going we're gonna to camp here just for a moment because for those that were here on Friday night say, and, and, and children's um, um, ministry, you know, we've been talking a lot about prayer and how important prayer is. Well, if our Bible is super important, prayer is ultimately important too. So prayer is vital to the Christian walk. We are to pray at all times, in all circumstances, for all people. Yes, even the one who might have cut you off. 
pray without ceasing, continuing to pray. So Martin Luther, I came across this as I've been studying the, the uh, Lord's Prayer, uh, a book written by Al Mohler. And Martin Luther was asked by his barber on prayer. And this is a quote, I don't have it up here. The quote from that Martin Luther gave his barber, we're talking about in the 1700s, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King. Here's his response. So a diligent and good barber, you must keep your thoughts, senses, and eyes precisely on the hair and scissors or razor and not forget where you trimmed or shaved. Four, if you want to talk a lot or become distracted thinking about something else, you might well cut someone's nose or mouth or even throat. I thought that was hilarious, but it's... Jesse was a hair a hairstylist. Uh, Miss Liss is a hairstylist. So I understand this this metaphor. I remember, you know, Jesse. She would cut her her finger with her shears just a little nick, and let me tell you something. That's, that would that baby would bleed. Now think about if you're actually in charge of somebody. Have you ever got the back of your ear ear like nicked? Man, that that baby hurts, right? The point is, is if you're taking your, your focus off of something as small as cutting hair, then how much more important is our prayer life going to be to make sure that we, are, we give out undivided attention? So Al Mohler, his response to this quote was, we must learn to pray and to resist distraction in prayer. Now, our prayers must be unhindered and free of distraction, but this does not mean that every prayer has to be in a quiet place with the door shut. It just means that our heart should be focused solely on communicating with God. You are communicating with the Creator through prayer. He already knows what you're talking about, but He wants that relationship. So let's go ahead and give Him what He deserves. But I have two cautions for you in prayer. One's found in Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 7, Jesus said, And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Now, meaningless repetition. Now, I know most of us have had kids at one point, or we still have small children. Now, a lot of kids, they pray something like this, Dear God, thank you for our food. Thank you for mommy and daddy. Love you. Amen. Right? There's nothing wrong with a, a prayer that we say day in and day out. But what's important is that when we go to the Lord, that we have something new to tell him. We're not going to sit there and tell the same. Everybody knows somebody that says the same story over and over and over again. And then we stop listening to that person. That's, that's, you're laughing, but that's what happens. And that's the same thing that's going to happen. Like, think about all these people that God's going to listen to their prayers, and he's going to listen to the same prayer over and over again that you really don't mean you're just checking a box. Our, pray, our prayers don't need to have the huge churchy words that we think God wants to hear either. A child's prayer is just fine. The second Caution I want to point out is found in James chapter 4, verse 3. It says, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Our prayers are answered when our prayers glorify God and not ourselves. So when we ask, or a lot of times we probably barter with the Lord to glorify us. And when we want to glorify us, our prayers will fall on deaf ear. Always pray. Pray without ceasing. Continuing on in verse 18, it says, In everything give thanks. This is going to be the last of the present tenses. Now, the original text is talking about the corporate worship. However, this also applies to each and every one of us who has called Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It is God's will that we give thanks to Jesus. Don't believe me. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. It says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
thanks to God, because he's the one who gives us the victory found in Jesus. That is why we should be giving thanks. But it is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, the second part of verse 18. Sometimes it's hard to give God thanks in all circumstances. Maybe the loss of a loved one, a car accident. Uh, maybe you just don't have enough money in the bank. Things are tight for everybody right now. However, when we remember what Jesus has done on the cross, that should put things into perspective that it's only temporary pain that we're feeling here. It's temporary. God's will, found in Christ Jesus, is everlasting. But I want you to remember that Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica. Paul is corporately showing the church his thanks for their continued dedication in the Lord. How Paul felt in private in his heart mirrors the words in his corporate letter. So God has a will for each of us that we will unpack in the next uh, section. So it is important to our integrity that our corporate worship mirrors our private worship. Concluding point number two, encouraging the believers to walk. Our private and corporate lifestyles should mirror each other. Look at that, I'm doing good. We're on point three. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to look at our personal private walk with the Lord. Yes, we could pray, with it, pray without ceasing, you know, always giving God the glory. All of that is done in prayer or done in private, but is also done corporately. But God knows what's on our heart. So he's going to give us two negative exhortations and three positive exhortations. And I want each of us to reflect on what God is telling us to do or telling us what not to do. So chapter 5, verse 19 says, Do not quench the Spirit. Or I like the NIRV, which is what a lot of children's Bibles are written in. It says, Do not, don't try to stop the Holy, what the Holy Spirit is doing. Don't try to stop what the Holy Spirit is doing. So, are you hindering the work of the Lord? Now, this could be something that you're not serving in an area where you know you're supposed to be serving. Or you might be that pebble that people keep on tripping over. Or, in layman's terms, are people tripping because you really don't look like you're a true believer? Or how about the simplest of ways we could be hindering the work of the Lord? Sharing the gospel. That simple. Are you sharing the gospel? Because I'm pretty sure if we all were, we'd have more people in our pews. So our second negative exhortation is found in uh, verse 20. It says, do not despise prophetic utterances. Now, I don't plan on camping a lot here because this is not my area of expertise. However, a prophecy or a prediction of something to come can be difficult to understand. And when we despise prophecies, we quench the Spirit. Please keep in mind that we must make sure that the prophecies are from the Lord and not from man. And we will find this in the next verse when we get there, which is why verse 21 is so powerful right after this negative exhortation. So each of us have been given a gift, though, which is found in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy according to the proportions of his faith. In service, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liber, liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So just a few of the gifts are prophecy, teaching, a leader, a service provider. But if we do not use these gifts the way God has told us to use them, we are quenching the Spirit. 
Thank goodness not many of us have been given the gift of prophecy, which may be why it's so hard for us to understand. But no matter what the gift that has been given to you, to I, we must make certain that we are obedient to his call for us to do what he has called us to do. Prophecy can be tough and challenging. So imagine hearing a flood that's going to come and wipe out all mankind except for a few people, a few family members that are living on your boat. Oh, and you live in the Middle East. Or there's another prophecy about this, this guy who's going to be born to an unmarried woman, and they're going to call him Emmanuel. Those are all, do you think anybody would like to speak prophecies? But through prayer, through corporate worship, and studying the Word of God, we can have the knowledge of what is, in fact, good and evil. So right on the heel of do not despise prophetic utterances, we have verse 21, it says, but examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good. Now, we are done with our negative, you know, uh, hand slaps, and now we're going to get some positive re-encouragement here. So our first positive exhortation, examine everything carefully, test everything, test prophecies, test the words that I am saying, test your Sunday school teachers. Test everything so you don't accept or reject everything or anything that you hear. Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, in the ESV, which is what our children use here, Instead of saying, so that you may prove, it says, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. The only way we know that is we know what's written in the pages of our Bibles. The second positive exhortation is hold fast to that which is good. Hold on to, possess, to keep to retain what you have learned through the careful examination of scriptures. And then it says in verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. Abstain or, av- or avoid every form of evil. This is the last positive exhortation that we have. And if, it is, if God is good and only good comes from God, then that means all else is evil. David wrote in in Psalm 34, verse 14, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Now, depart from anything in which is not from the Lord. So if you are doing something, following someone, or maybe even supporting a company that doesn't align with the teaching of God, then we could be hindering the spirit. We are entertaining evil. However, uh, abstaining from evil allows us into the presence of the Lord. Thus, we can have the comfort found in verse 23, that which we seek peace. Verse 23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete, without blame, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctification it means to be purified, to become like Christ, to be holy, to be set apart, preserved, complete. So when I was thinking about this and, and praying over this, about being preserved, I think of like a taxidermy. Now, we were at a birthday party, and Declan would not use the restroom because he was afraid that the turkey on the wall was going to come out and get him. <laughs> I kid you not. That's a pretty good taxidermy. That's a pretty, that's a pretty good pr- a preservation of that animal to where it looks like that turkey's going to attack you even though he's stuffed. And that's what we all get when we place our faith in Christ. We get to be preserved complete. Our souls will be, will be preserved for eternity. We will be 
blameless. Without blame, it says. Thus, today's encouragement to finish the walk of life with obedience. And that's where I'm going to leave us today, is when in our walk, I want us to encourage one another. I want us to make sure that we are steadfast in our own quiet times and reading of our Bibles. Because if you want things to change, that means we should be changing. Because ultimately, we are to look like Christ, which we talked about in the beginning. So our concluding point, number three, we are called by God to look like Jesus through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. Encouraging the believer's walk, faithfulness in private leads to faithfulness as a church. By this, by knowing that, our, that we're faithful in private, we can have the assurance to be worthy to be called the ambassador of Christ or an approved workman in which we live every day for Christ. By this, the world will know our name. So therefore, I want to encourage you as a believer of Jesus to walk in faithfulness and obedience Encouraging the faithful Christians walk. Now, I want to have you all stand for our invitation. So have you all been quenching the spirit, as Paul wrote? Have you been allowing the company of evil in your presence? We must live a life where our integrity is not in jeopardy or question. No, however, no matter the time or setting of our worship, our patterns and lifestyles ought to be the same, corporately and privately. So if you know you have been living in dis disobedience, or you know you need to seek forgiveness from the Lord, I want to invite you to the altar. If you need prayer, the altar is open. I want you to stop walking in the ways of the evil and walk with Jesus. Please do not leave this building until you have come forward and say, yes, I know for certain I have given my life to Christ. So as we sing this last song, I invite you to the altar and give it all to the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and we praise you. The, the call went out, Lord, to those that are living in disobedience, to those uh, that might not know where they stand in your family. So, Father, as we're reflecting through this last song, anybody that has something on their heart, Lord, the, the altar is open. You know it's on their heart. Just let them come up here and confess it. Let that burden be released from them. So, Father, these are not my words but yours because I'm not worthy enough to stand in this pulpit, Lord. But, Father, I thank you for the opportunity to, to proclaim your word. And Father, may you get all the honor and the glory. So Father, send us out from this corporate worship and bring us back from our private worship. That way we can be made in unity, Lord. So Father, we thank you. We praise you for Jesus. We give you all the honor and glory. Amen. Amen. The altar's open.